Okay, well, welcome everybody to our professional development webinar series for 4-H. I'm excited to see you all on this morning. Um, if you're just now jumping on, I put a link in the chat box and that's linked to TJ's presentation this morning. So you can go ahead and open that up. And I'm excited today to welcome TJ Prochaska from um, the North Central Research Search Extension Center in Minot. He's the Extension and Crop Protection Specialist. And I'll just say personally about three or four years ago, he came to camp with Lindsay and I, and he did a fantastic job leading some insect activities with the youth. And they just loved it that day. He was so enthusiastic and just fun. So I'm really um, thrilled that he has agreed to um, do this with us today and share um, some activities that you can do with your youth and some updates to our 4-H entomology projects. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to TJ. Great, uh, thanks, Megan. Uh, you just made me flash back to our survivor challenge with all the eating crickets and stuff there that day uh, when you brought that up. Uh, anyway, uh, as Megan said, I wanted to get into um, just talking about some entomological activities that I utilize uh, with 4 H students along the way. And this isn't meant to be formal. So if there's ever comments or questions, uh, you're always free to unmute yourself and I'll try to pause here and there to see if there's any questions or comments that want to be said, or you can put it in the chat. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. There we go. Uh, so I want to start off with some of our 4-H activities. Uh, you know, culturally, the US is probably one of the few states where Insects have a bad rap, really at every turn of the imagination. Now, there's just kind of a fear of insects here. And if you go to other places in the world, they're actually a delicacy. They're part of diets and stuff like that. And I always remember I had a friend in my PhD from Japan, um, the emperor there apparently is a huge entomology collector. And I was always told if I found something um, super cool that I could get rich fast by selling something to him. But it, entomology is just a huge deal across the globe. And with that, I always like to start off with some interesting facts. Um, you know, insects are, you know, kind of bizarre in themselves and, and how they look, how they work, how they move or interact with their environment. But just some of the interesting numbers behind them can be staggering. The Entomological Society of America says that currently there's about a million insects that have been described. That's a million different type of insects that we know of. Uh, the same society also estimates we could be 20 to 30 million total types of insects possible, which means we're really scratching the surface. Even if you consider 20 million to be the bottom number, that means we're just scratching the surface. As I said, a lot of people here always think insects in a bad way, but they can be beneficial uh, in many different ways. Uh, of course, you can see on there, pollination is probably the number one way we deem them to be um, important. Uh, I know there's uh, an article out there, the New York Times, the Pollinator po Partnership put out there, you know, 35% of pollination is directly tied to insect movement. Uh, that's a pretty high number in my opinion, thinking about other methods of pollination that exist, wildlife movement, wind movement, and stuff like that. Their market value is huge overall. You're talking about $577 billion globally, $40 billion in the United States. And I'm gonna put an asterisk on that number. That was a few years ago. If I could take a guess, I'd say that number has climbed a little bit over the years. Medically, insects can be important too. And I'm gonna glance through some of my uh, screenshots here just to see reactions when I say this, but I always think about what, I did a presentation on global grand challenges in my PhD and how insects can play an important role. And there's studies out there that show medically maggots and matures of some fly species can actually be used in emergency room settings. So a burn, vernet, a burn victim can come into the unit. Uh, of course, they'll put the maggots on the wounds and they will only feed on the dead tissue. They don't care for the live tissue. So once they've cleaned it up, they essentially leave the uh, patient that they're on. But two benefits come from it. One, it reduces between 20, 30% infection rate. And two, it speeds up the process at which that wound can heal. So they have their place medically. 
of course, they're great decomposers in the environment, and they can be huge in terms of environmental quality indicators. What I mean by that is, especially in aquatic settings, uh, insects like mayfly, damselfly, dragonfly will not be visible if it's a contaminated area. But if that environment is clean in that aquatic area, you know, a stream pond, it's a good environmental indicator seeing it's a healthy environment. Then we'll talk about food. That's another very important part of it for a beneficial, but we'll come back to that one here a little bit later. When I think of a model for education, I'm not sure there's anything that maybe stands out more than insects do in education. Uh, they play numerous roles uh, and that's a huge educational benefit in itself. They're easy to access and they can be used for teaching purposes. One thing, kids are drawn to them. I always remember being at the uh, hay market, farmer's market in Lincoln, Nebraska, and kids just came from all over. They just knew when the insects were there. Their parents, on the other hand, were not completely so happy. When I think about some of the times I've worked with kids hands-on, of course, I have my pet tarantula here that I take uh, with me from time to time, but tobacco hornworm and Madagascar hissing cockroach are probably two of the most known educational tools. Uh, the tomato hornworm allows you to see different stages of the life cycle, see how it changes as it grows. Then of course, uh, there's the hissing cockroach. It's something that doesn't really survive in the US. It's kind of too cold, it's searching for Madagascar, so it could never establish as a pest, but it's something you can do food experiments on. And I always remember teaching that at Nebraska. Some people would put chocolate on one side and something else on the other side. Chocolate and cheese comes to mind as two of them that were very popular with students uh, overall. Then there's scientific classification. When I think about scientific classification, of course, I'm talking about our kingdom and phylum areas. Um, you know, in any area, agriculture, in viruses, in plant science, we talk about classifying all of our plants to help identify them and understand them. Insects are a part of that too, and they're grouped based on common characteristics. And we're going to talk about some of those characteristics in a bit. Of course, you see one of my favorite insects on here. This is the milkweed beetle, longhorn beetle uh, from family Cerambicidae. Of course, you can see the long, I'm gonna pull up my laser. Uh, you can see the long uh, antenna on here. Uh, that's one of the characteristics of family Cerambicidae. If I imagine rolling the antenna backwards, it's longer than half the body and sometimes even longer than the body itself. If I put that into play for the human, uh, race. Of course, you can see animalia, chordatum, mammalia, getting down to primates. And of course, we're multicellular. That's one of our uh, characteristics that we're grouped based on, just to give one suggestion. Okay. So if we're talking about characteristics, uh, there are a few of them that we can look to that will merge different insects into different groups. And you know, unless you're putting these under the scope, a lot of times we probably don't realize the differences in shapes that you can have for insects. So, you know, you have bread-like mephiliform. Uh, flabellate here, this actually expands. If you can imagine one of those paper fans when it's hot, you can wave, this will actually expand to mimic a fan. Uh, some beetles come that. I'd say the most common one is to Disney's a bug's life. I always think about the ants, bull antenna, you can always picture that on the ants, uh, similar in some of our bees uh, in the area. So that's one of the more common ones that people recognize. As you can see kind of the saw blade or saw tooth there, uh, plumose or feather-like antenna. These are just some of them that exist that could be used to separate based on characteristics. Then we have mouth parts. Uh, of course, uh, insects are some of the oldest living organisms uh, in the area. And you know, they've evolved for millions of years, feed on different things. If they all have the same food source, they won't have anything to feed on. Especially with the idea of one in every five organisms is a beetle in itself. It just tells you how big the insect world really is. We have what we call piercing sucking mouth parts. I think of a mosquito that's wanting to feed on blood. We have things like uh, stink bugs that will feed on the phloem in plants, but we call this the beak. These all come together like a straw and they can pierce to access the phloem beneath. Swing lapping, uh, mouth parts are shaped this way to help them 
set up some of their um, honeybee hives uh, in their colony, help give it shape. But this is to some of the bees chewing, lapping, sponging mouth parts, uh, house flies. So right here, if I could flip 3D wise around, uh, this part would be like a sponge, it'd be 3D. These hairs here kind of act as a knife. So they will cut, get the blood exposed, and then they can sponge up that blood source if needed. Siphoning to a butterfly will unravel. You have a long straw you can put into the flower, access the nectar. And of course, we have our chewing. I think of all the caterpillars. I think of uh, grasshoppers, of course, that feed in gardens or on agriculture related crops. So these are going to be our five mouth parts. And then we have our wing types. Uh, we have uh, five different wing types. So membranous, uh, of course, tr almost transparent to a slight coloration. I always kind of think of film, I guess that puts an age to me because I remember the film days from camera, have that colored reflection as it would come back. You have that in the membranous wings. Scalies on the uh, butterflies and on the moths. And if you actually put a butterfly under its microscope, it actually looks like a snake. The scales overlap and that's for water displacement. So it's flying through the air. That overlapping scales allow the water to come off quicker. We have elytra. This is something to the beetle. So here we have these hard wing covers. This is our elytra, this hard thickened wing cover. Beetles, this actually moves to the side and underneath it you have membranous wings. So that elytra is just that hard protective covering. And the grasshoppers have leathery, almost a leathery-like feel that they can use to fly uh, when they're in movement. One more wing type that I couldn't get to fit on that slide is hemolytra. So if I think hemi, hemisphere, that's half, hemi is half. So two characteristics to uh, hemipterans are true bugs, so aphids, box elder bugs, stink bugs. One, the wings lie in an X. So one, you have one wing here, so you can see part of that X. The wing, comes this way and then it's underneath the other wing, but you get that X there. So half part of this, you have the leathery, more thick in top. And on the base, you have the membranous type of wing. So hemi, you have half and half, and that's hemolytra, okay? And then finally, we get into uh, the legs. Uh, five different types of legs, raptorial, more for grabbing and holding, grasping on the things, I think praying mantis, uh, natatorial, for swimming, moving in water. So I think of the immature to a mayfly or a dragonfly. Fossorial, mole cricket. I can tunnel through the soil underneath, have a jumping leg, so material for grasshopper. And I can't forget cursorial. Uh, this is for running, moving at fast paces. So those are the characteristics. And that's why I want to have a brief stopping point. There was a lot of information, but I just want to see if there's any comments or questions before we get into some of the activities that are kind of built around this. Okay. No quick questions there. Okay, so one of my first activities that I like to do is the dichotomous key exercise. And if any of you are ever interested in doing this, I'm always willing to email this out to you guys. Uh, you'll just have to let me know. But dichotomous key is used in you know plant science, it can be used in viruses, can be used in entomology and wildlife, but essentially it's for a person that you found something, you don't know what it is, but you want to identify it. And a dichotomous key essentially sets things up in couplets, and it's like a roadmap to help you identify. So I like to start with money. This is a project we had at the University of Nebraska that we use with students there to help kind of give this away. We're all familiar with different coins. So um, you know, let's take a quarter. All of us know what a quarter is. So let's blank that for our minds and pretend we don't remember what a quarter is. So we would kind of go through step by step. So is my object made out of metal or is it made out of paper? Well, if I think of a quarter, it's going to be made out of metal. So I can follow this along and it says proceed to step two. So now I go to two A to B. Is my quarter brown or coppery in color or is it silver? Well, a quarter is silver, so proceed to step three. If I turn it on its edge, look at the perimeter. Is it smooth around? A lot of times I think of that nickel perfectly smooth. Uh, if anything else has ridges or slots cut into it, so proceed to step four. What's on the back? 
you know, it doesn't have a torch, it doesn't have an eagle or skates. Of course, this looks like we could all have the updates uh, with the new quarters coming out on uh, Women's History. That'll be fun to see, but that may need an update here in a little bit to have that. But we identify this as a quarter. So you just step toe it out, step by step, one set of questions at a time. And these are questions that you can physically look at and determine if that's there. Once I'm done with that, I don't always stop there. I like to flip my sheet over and on the back, I have uh, a set of a uh, grouping of fruits there. We're all familiar with fruits. So I usually challenge my students and they can work in groups, small groups. And I want them to build that uh, doing this with groups. So you could, you know, you have one A and one B that you're going to begin separating out and then going down. Um, so you can do this by colors. You can do this by shapes. Uh, you can have spherical, non-spherical. Of course, non-spherical will probably be strawberry, banana. That can step down to another step. Your other three would go down to the step below that, if you will. But there's no one way to do this. You're essentially looking for characteristics physically that you can tiptoe this out to build one. Uh, one of the big things I always have to kind of get away from is sometimes they'll they want to stop so early. If you have three of them that are in a circle, they'll go like three, three, B, three, C. But in these, we always want to have them in couplets. Okay. So now I can step forward. And if you're following along in yours, you'll see in places I have these underlined features. If I can come back to you. It looks like with my laser, I can't click on that. But if you click on these underlines, it'll actually open it up. So you'll get access to this file in that one and you'll see the full one. My image, I only have a partial one. Obviously you can see it goes to step 15, but I'm showing you one example that we can use to identify uh, to different orders. Of course, the flies order Diptera, true bugs order Hemiptera. This is a pretty simple one that really looks at insects only. This will not work for immatures, but this is just one um, key that I give out to 4-H who want to do a, a key to help identify down to order some of their specimens to turn in in an insect collection. Okay. Then we have our math parts marathon. And this is where I'm hoping uh, you'll be able to jump in if you have any comments or questions. I know some of you have seen this before and may want to jump in with something that I might be missing and be willing to do that. Um, but this link again will give you to uh, University of Florida 4 H websites. Uh, they call it math parts mayhem because I've made it more of a marathon game uh, compared to just having groups of activities. But here's the supplies needed, and the number of supplies of each you would need will depend squarely on the number of kids you're working with. Okay, so high seed juice box, uh, apple juice, you see disposable cups, plates, bowls, uh, straws, a type of cereal, and I always put, consider allergies. I keep thinking of the peanut made cereals, don't want to have any impact there, and sponges. It's kind of an interesting collection of items to have together, isn't it? So what are we doing with these? Essentially, we're wanting to mimic uh, the different types of mouth parts that we went through. So traditionally, I set this up, and they don't have to be in any particular order. This is just one way. I mean, you could high see here, uh, move cereal there, have this move across. It can be really in any order. It's just kind of the motion of movement you want to have, which could be an issue if you have a lot of students participating at once. Essentially, um, you'll set it up in this formation. And one thing I should note, uh, the bowl here, you're going to have two sets of bowls uh, set here, and you'll actually share the table across to have an empty set of bowls. Well, why are we doing that? Well, because we're going to mimic stuff. So we're going to have the butterfly of regular straw and cups. So I talked about earlier that proboscis of rolls you can put into a deep flower to pull the nectar. That's going to be the apple juice. Your apple juice is the nectar in the cup. They can take a straw, put it into the cup, and they're going to uh, drink all of it dry. Then you can have them run to another table, right? So if we stay in order, uh, this one says sponge. So we'll go to the bowl of sponges and water. If you are going step by step from the directions in the PowerPoint, you're going to notice it's a little different than in how I do it. But the idea is you're going to use the sponge and you're going to have water in this bowls and you put the sponge in to pull the water up. 
and the directions in the Florida thing says to squeeze the water into your mouth, which I've kind of altered this because a lot of sponges have chemicals anymore. So I don't necessarily have them squeeze it into their mouth. Instead, across from them, I'll have empty bowls. So they'll run back and forth using that sponge to move water to this empty bowl. But you can't do it in one time. You always have to go back several times. So they run back and forth, moving water from one table to the other one uh, to move that over. So that could mimic the fly. Uh, the bug, the juice box straw, if you think about an aphid or a mosquito, uh, it's going to have, that'll be the high seed juice boxes, have that straw like you start in, pull off the box, pierce the top of the box to access the juice, and you'll drink that dry. And then finally, the grasshopper. This is where I have the most fun. Uh, you'll have a plate, you'll put equal amounts of cereal into each one, but the students have to eat the cereal on the plate without the use of their hands. So some students will put the plate on the floor and try to eat it on its own. Others leave it on the table, but you can't use hands. And the one thing is uh, for all of these stations, uh, you can alter how long you want it to be. The more food, cereal you put on the plate, the more juice you put in, it takes a little longer to go through. The less you put on it, it goes through a little quicker. So that's something you can choose to follow through on. So you see a kind of a suggested amount, but this will be dependent on how long you want the activity to last. So you can see some of this in motion in some of the photos here. So you can see here, uh, really concentrating on eating some of the food in the grasshopper mimic of the mouth part marathon. When I'm done with that, uh, this is one of my posters that I can connect to real life insects that you will see every day. Uh, just kind of show some of the different mouth parts that they have. Uh, so you can see what you mimic overall. So before I move on to the pollinator game, any quick uh, questions to the mouth part marathon? Hey, TJ, I'm just curious, has anybody out there done this activity? So uh, I know Sarah Clemens has used this activity a few times. Uh, we've done it here in Minot uh, with some of the 4 Hers that I was there. And I know uh, Rachel Wald has expressed interest in doing this a few times. So uh, some agents are utilizing this uh, here, at least in the North Central part of the city. I didn't know if anybody on today could share their experience with it. I have. This is Danielle. I'm sorry. Um, I have done this in my Nuts About Nature class that I had started here in Oaks. And it's a, it's a variation of this, but it's so much fun for the kids to actually visually see how these insects are eating. You know, they're not like our mouths. So how do they get fed? How do they, uh, you know, all those different things that insects do. This is a really, really cool hands-on visual for them. I love it. Oh, thanks for sharing, Danielle. That's great. And then Sarah Lighty said, I'll did it at camp. And TJ did it at camp with Lindsay and me that year. Um, and Katie said, looks interesting. So yeah, thank you for sharing. Okay, cool. Uh, next, I wanna get into the pollinator game. And I know some of you have probably done this before. Uh, Amelia Dahl, this is one she used when she was the 4-H agent down in Burley County. Um, I always like to start off with this photo. This was a promotional thing that Whole Foods Market did. This is a grocery store chain on the East Coast. And they wanted to give a visual of the different foods in the produce area that have an impact from insect pollination. So to you and I, we walk into this and this is what we expect in the produce section at the grocery store. But they wanted to go a step further and show what does it look like if we start losing our pollinator? So if those pollinators are missing, it's a little mind blowing to see the differences you see there. Uh, we took away some of them that are impacted by insects related pollination. So of course, there's always some fruits and vegetables that don't necessarily need it and they stay behind. But the ones that do look to that, um, you see those removed. I always love showcasing this chart. Uh, this, of course, comes from um, the NDSU Extension Beautiful Landscapes Guide, uh, Doctors. Esther McGinnis and Janet Canodal put this together, but I always love to show off, you know, these are some of the common backyard or garden crops, right? We can show off what honeybees impact, what do bumblebees impact. 
And a lot of people don't realize this. We always connect a lot of our bees and pollination here, but actually most of plants are actually done by other solitary native bees. So you see some of them listed here and whether bee pollination is required by that specific crop. And uh, you can see apples, yes, um, you know, beans not required. I came down to tomatoes, not completely required, but it helps boost yield return if they are present and in that area, it's beneficial uh, to uh, those crops out in those gardens. So the pollinator game, I always like to highlight, you know, 20,000 species of bee, uh, you know, 70 percent are underground. And again, a lot of our solitary bees are really what's responsible for a lot of our pollination that takes place. Uh, on the next slide, you will see the directions to this thing that I have attached, underlined, but I really just want to draw some of the supplies. So a large bowl, Starburst original candy, and you're going to connect the colors of the Starburst wrappers with the colors of the flowers. So this is what I call the flower sets. And in here, I made these on the computer, and I'm always willing to share these with anyone who wants it. I know Amelia and some other uh, agents who've used this will have the students draw these out, add to the project. Uh, essentially, you see cotton there, you'll glue cotton down in the middle here. This is an interesting one, and I'll talk about this multicolored one here in a moment. But essentially, here are your kind of your directions, and as you can see, there's actually a book that goes along with it. Um, it talks about how to overrun this activity. Uh, it provides pictures and stuff of different plants that do require insect pollination uh, throughout the season for it to be pollinated. But you'll see one starburst candy. I, you know, I kind of give way on this. A lot of times I like to, depending on the number of people, I might let them come back and forth uh, to the bowl to pull more than one starburst out at a time, but they can only take one at a time. But essentially, uh, you'll have the big bowl in the middle of the table or the room, dump the uh, starburst in the middle, and then you cover it and overlay it all with cheese balls or Cheetos. And that dust falls on top of that wrapper. So when they go in to pull that out, they can walk to uh, the flowers and essentially they'll rub that wrapper onto the uh, cotton to essentially pollinate it. And the goal is, you know, you can't take pollen from a corn plant and go pollinate a rose. They don't really work. So here, your color is your species, if you will. So you would take your blue wrapper and you would go to the blue colored plant to do your pollination. My multicolored one is something that I just added. It's not part of the directions, but we've gotten to a place in horticulture where genetically there's a lot of GMOs that we look to beautify gardens. And I always think of the wave petunia, the gray, uh, purple and white wave uh, flower, a lot of times it looks really awesome in the garden, but when you start moving genetics like that, you don't get full service of the reproductive parts of the plant essentially. So you might have it be sterile and may not be able to reproduce. So a lot of times I will do one of two things or either I'll leave the cotton off the flower because you can't pollinate it or I'll put it on in hopes that no one will pollinate it. And if someone does, I will explain why this plant wouldn't have been uh, just for that purpose, okay? That is the pollinator game, okay? One of the other big projects I really like to do is the bee hotel. And I know I will break again for questions after this because this is an activity a lot of people like to do and uh, there's a lot to it, okay? So, so I said solitary bees, you know, 75% of bees are solitary and some of them live above ground. I said 70% earlier are underground, so at least 30% above ground, but they like to live by themselves and they need to seek shelter. They need protection from weather, but they need shelter in areas where food and water resources are nearby. And the hotels have become very popular in the last few years. I've seen them really small, you know, size of a tin can to the side of an entire building, you know, three stories in the air. The nice thing about solitary bees is they don't necessarily care who their neighbors are. So you can have one unit with multiple species living together, but they'll come in, they'll lay eggs that will hatch the next growing season, but they leave enough room at the end just for them to be out of the elements. So this is where we come in and we kind of build some of our own that you can take forward with your grade students. Here you have your materials. And for those of you who've done it with me in the past, this is the one that I've done in the past. It's a lot cheaper to utilize and some of the supplies are a lot cheaper. 
Uh, but I know Rebecca Hager uh, down in Newtown and I were researching and we came up with new ideas using, you know, mugs, pure white mugs that kids can decorate before they utilize or even tin cans. So PVC pipe is another one I heard that's been used that's common. Fabric squares, so if you have, you know, PVC pipe or the toilet paper roll, you'll rubber band that to the back of a back end. Of course, a tin can a mug is probably going to have a back end and not be needed. Stringer yarn, really just needed to have help hang somewhere. Of course, a mug will have that with the handle. Paper puncher, really just for helping put the string on if you're using the paper towel roll or the toilet paper roll. It is kind of an option. Um, of course, if I take the straw out, it's a few inches long. Sometimes I will put in the straw, twist it in and out, and you'll put a, pretty much a clay plug at the end. There are some species that will come in, lay eggs, utilizing that as a back protective piece. But there are some straws we leave blank with no clay because for some species, they prefer to do it on their own. So usually I do a little bit of both and I mix them at the back end. And of course, that part of that straw would be cure at the back to be utilized. You want that open for them to be able to come and inhabit it if you want them to do that. Here I have 40 straws listed. This number is tied to this particular one. A lot of times I cut it in half and you're able to put the straws in. If you're utilizing a tin cup or a tin can or the mug, we're probably gonna have to play to see how many really go in there. Uh, paper straws can be a little expensive. So we tend to use them mainly because plastic gains heat dislodges the environment and a lot of uh, solitary bees won't use it if it's too hot. And of course, scissors to go ahead and move that. So, uh, that is kind of the uh, materials needed and kind of the overall design for uh, bee hotels. Uh, has anyone out there been able to utilize this uh, so far uh, in any of their activities? Yep, I did it and it came out real great. And I think, Rebecca, I think you did the tin cans one. Did you utilize paper straws or did you use the, uh, I see reeds in the photo that I have here. I didn't know which way you went with that. I went with uh, paper colored straws, kind of the, some of them were solid color and some of them had kind of a stripey effect to them. Cool. Hey, Rebecca. Rebecca, was it hard to find the paper straws? I found them on Amazon. Okay. Are they expensive? I got a thousand for seven dollars. Okay. A hundred for seven dollars. No, it was three hundred for seven dollars. Okay. And you can get them at places like Hobby Lobby too, but it's like five dollars there for twenty. Right. Yeah. I remember whenever Lindsay and I were looking, it was kind of more expensive. I think we ordered them, but I do remember that part. Right. And then Danielle said that she used the mouth parts game for nuts and about nature and senior, senior centers, senior living facilities and nursing homes as well. And it was well received. Cool, that's awesome. Danielle, did you do this um, B Hotel too? We did, we did. We did it as a bug hotel and um, it was a little woodworking as well. So they created a wooden box with a bat. Um, you know, they got to use hammers and nails and that kind of fun stuff first. And then we shoved lots of different things inside but I love this idea with the straws we had just um, natural materials when we did it but this is a great idea I'll try this for sure I like the idea of incorporating the woodworking in there too I hadn't thought about that that's really cool yep yeah, and I, as I look on this photo I see the pine cone and a lot of times um, let's see does my other side have the pine cones in so why do you have pine cones into them or straw or stuff into it for other beneficial insects, a lot of times you'll see, you know, chicken wire or something over this to hold the pine cones in place, but it's like butterflies can come in, they'll lay eggs inside and it gives a shelter for it. So a bug hotel is probably better than bee hotel because you can put other things into it and get beneficial insects, get that benefit beyond the bees as well. So, uh, and you'll see here yellow preferred. A lot of times I use yellow because that's just a common color that insects are attracted to. Uh, there are darker colors a lot of times uh, go unnoticed by insects where the brighter ones are noticed, but it's fun to use some of the different colors and let students see the different responses that they have to them. 
Uh, one of the other things that I like to do is the live insect scavenger hunt. Uh, scavenger hunt, you know, I have a collecting net. A lot of times I'll do with a group of students, you know, four or five students per net. I'll give them a Ziploc bag, put in their insects that they collect, or they can use like a collecting jar. And, you know, there are some that are glass and I try to hesitate with those. I don't want it to get broken and cut someone. But that's where I found that, you know, prescription bottles are amazing for that. They don't get dropped and broken very easy. And the nice thing about it is this is something if you don't necessarily need back immediately. You can get a lot, several of these that keep collecting when stuff is full. And I can throw in the freezer and a week later come back if I want to use that for my insect collection. Now I have my specimens that are already froze and I can start thinking about the process of pinning them. So. What do I use? These are kind of a generic list. I put them, of course, in common names. Uh, a lot of these are very familiar to a lot of students that can go collecting and find in a lot of different settings. Uh, you'll notice down here, I have the asterisk here. Uh, you know, some people have allergies to them and some just are not comfortable with it. So this is one I usually don't necessarily require unless I'm present. Uh, because I'm okay if I get stung and I will move it into their vial for them. But I know there's a lot of parents and educators out there that are hesitant about that too. So uh, this is one that may or may not be on the list depending on what the comfort level as the person is uh, hosting the scavenger hunt, okay? But the rest of these are pretty uh, easily well known. Uh, so, you know, I have Beetle almost on here twice. I have Ladybug listed somewhere. Uh, right there. And then I have another beetle. You can see like a ground beetle listed there. So it's one of the other things that I got to do. And then finally, the last activity uh, before we turn over to uh, looking at some of the state fair project updates, but Enomophagia has become a huge thing uh, in the world. Uh, really, as I said at the beginning, the U.S. is really, just because of a culture difference, is really the one that is reserved and almost grossed out from dealing with this. And yes, I do have this book on my desk. Uh, I use it quite often, to be honest with you. Um, it has a, it has many different recipes in there. But as I come to the next slide, you'll see the one that I utilize the most. And I think, Megan and Lindsay, I think this is the one we utilize uh, during our scaven or survivor camp days. Uh, it was kind of funny. Everyone was kind of scared of it at first and warmed up to the idea as we went through the day. Um, but, you know, you've got the entire... Uh, recipe listed there and it's pretty simple actually to put together. Uh, there is a website uh, that I get my crickets from. Uh, I don't really go collect things out in the field because you never know what kind of chemicals they've been interacting with at a field site location. So uh, typically I utilize that website. So what does the nutritional value look like, right? So this is per 100 grams of insects, which really isn't that many in some of these. So if I come here, I see small grasshoppers, 20 grams of protein for 100 grams of insects by weight. If I jump onto the scale, I see lean beef at 27, this at 28. Uh, this is actually one of the grand challenges the Animological Society of America is utilizing uh, in hopes of helping feed the world that's growing so rapidly. So uh, you're just seeing some of the insects that are listed here. And of course, this is a study by Iowa State looking at some of the nutritional values that these type of insects hold. Uh, to be used for that kind of purpose. So, uh, you know, Lindsay, Megan, do you have anything you want to say to the uh, nutritional, the food part of this, since you guys have seen this in action? Um, it was really fun. I was a little skeptical at first, but Lindsay and I got the camp cook to actually help put it together. And she's like, okay. And the, 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 the bugs were like, like smaller than your like fingernail honestly they aren't huge or anything and so I, I think it's a whole mind game and the kids really enjoyed it like it was a, one of our challenges because it's a survivor camp and it went really well and honestly like I ate it, it it wasn't like gross or anything so I think it's a mind thing that people have so it was really fun actually so I did not eat the bugs, but Megan did surprisingly. So, but the kid, most of the kids did, even after they said they weren't going to try it. And obviously it was up to them if they wanted to try it or not, but most of them did. And some of the kids were like having seconds. So. I, I remember that. I just remember that huge turn in opinions by them. 
the one thing I wanted to point out is, so here you see some of the crickets for this. There are adult crickets and immature crickets. So if you ever choose to follow this and do this, always get immature. Uh, the reason for that on crickets, on the adults, on the legs, there's these fine barbs uh, for a defense mechanism that do not exist on the immatures. So always go to the immature side when you, if you choose to go down and do this activity. Okay. All right, uh, so this is where I kind of want to pivot just a little bit to uh, just some brief updates to the 4-H um, projects. And the background here is I always get the excitement of judging the entomology stuff at the North Dakota State Fair. And this really happened a couple years ago for the first time. And this was mainly to the insect collections at first, but uh, I probably had, you know, seven or eight of them that were turned in. But as I went through them, I found I had two trends. I had a trend where I had an assortment of insects, but they were kind of beat up. It wasn't put together um, nicely. It was kind of rough around the edges. And the other trend was I had a beautifully set up purpose one, a collection, except I had 15 specimens of the same insect. And that is a very hard line to walk down for judging purposes. So you had one that, you know, they put a ton of time and effort in seeking out many different types of insects. Then the other one, they put that much time or more in making it look nice. And when I talk to parents and stuff, the one thing I always hear is there's not a lot of background information to help guide them through the process. And when I go to the 4-H book, uh, this is kind of the 4-H book I always get at the state fair. And as you can see, I kind of get my classes but so I kind of use my background and what I know a collection should look like uh, to help grade it. I clearly take age into it because uh, I know an, what an eight-year-old cement is going to look a lot different from an 18-year-old. And when you type in NDSU entomology, this page comes up on Google. Uh, it's an amazing page for ideas, but really that's what it is. It's kind of an idea for projects and it really doesn't give any structure to the project themselves. So that's why I kind of pulled that committee together to talk about what could we do to help give not just parents a little bit more structure, but uh, you know, 4-H leaders and so forth to give them that. So I pulled them together to talk about, you know, not a lot of details. Parents are requesting a little bit more directions. There's plenty of suggestions of projects to do, but where do we start? So we really focus on two areas, insect collections and the bee hotels. So we'll start with the collections first. And one of the things is uh, Patrick Bose, who is Dr. Jan Knodel's uh, research technician. And I, a few years ago, we went out to talk about how to build collections. And this is one of the PowerPoints we use. And here, you're just seeing a couple of slides. This is about a 12, 13, 14 slide thing that goes into a lot more detail. But this is some of the detail we're wanting to add to this. Uh, we and this could be just on the website, but you know, in this case, show off what kind of information is on a label. You know, where did I find it? North Dakota, Cass County, uh, agronomy farm. You know, it was collected by myself. On what here? I'm not. I don't need Roman numerals for my. I mean, if it says, you know, the 18th of November, 2022, I'm going to be happy. Uh, I'm not going to look to that type of structure. Longitude, latitude, not really needed. Additionally, when I look at it, I look for North Dakota, Cass County, more generic. I always found on the Prochaska residence. Okay. Uh, I'll go to that. I picked a date, I, I collected it, and that's kind of what I use for my top one. The bottom label is how do I identify it as? Okay. How should the labels look on the pin? What, where can I pin it? So you can see the black dots here. This is where I can pin. And you can see for most of these, it's on the right side of the insect. This is a structure set up by museum. So you pin on that side, the left side always faces the display. And you pin to the one side because if you go through the center, you withstand damaging the entire specimen. Where if you do it to the side, you at least have half the insect that probably won't be damaged and that can face the display to people walking by. So that's why we tend to do it. But this kind of gives you, you know, not that you have to buy a pinning block, but it just kind of shows you the step, you know, this would be the ultimate height. I would like enough room that you can put your fingers down and not hurt your insect. 
the labels can be utilized to, you know, close to similar levels across the board. As I said, just a couple slides from that, uh, that, that presentation has a lot more background information. This is a slide from uh, that I pulled off the internet that shows you how should it look in the grand scheme of things on the computer, okay, or in real life, not on the computer, in real life. And the goal is, is to group, group them together. So if you have a bunch of butterflies and moths, put them in the same area of the box. If you have a bunch of beetles, group them together. A bunch of grasshoppers or crickets, group them together. So kind of pin groups in that type of format. So if I'm wanting to build a collection for 4 h these are probably the five things I'm going to look at. So I have them grouped together. So I have the information on my labels. Where is the height of my pen? You don't want the insect so far down, you don't have room to read the labels below. Do I have variety versus repeated insects? And what is my identification? You can see we broke this up into three classes now. So you can see 10 specimens, no repeats, ID to order. And if the 4 h would like to, you could go to common name, you know, uh, long horned grasshopper, ladybug, something like that for your common name. In class two, you can use your 10 from the first one, but you're going to add 10 more, but you're going to expand the identification. For class three, you can use your 20 from previous, but you're going to build 10 more. Uh, with no repeats, and then you're going to go more depth into the order. Uh, I'm going to kind of skip to the next slide. Same thing, just different format, but essentially this is the rubric we're presenting. Okay, so you know what are the requirements? Are they met? Species uh, that you needed to identify. Uh, new specimens were added for classes two to three. Uh, how many errors? And I, you know, for me, I will go in and correct things at the state fair, but I don't require that at county level because I know not everyone has the background to know that. Um, mounting, you know, what does the pens look like? Labels, does it have the proper information and appearance? Okay, so those are kind of the suggestions being left in play for uh, the insect collections. And just a couple of slides left uh, for B Hotels. Uh, of course, you're seeing photos that were taken from Nebraska State Fair. Uh, I spent many years there um, helping judge events like this there as well. And you can see students' projects here that they've turned in. And you know, one of the goals there is to limit costs. And this was always one of my favorite ones. Uh, so you see, he pulled a lot of branches down. But what is this? This is one of the old fashioned radiators from antique cars. What a cool way to limit money. There's an old car in the back in the tree line that they took it out uh, that he utilized. You see different examples of what it could look like, how they built it or color schemed it. So what did we want to do? We decided to break this into two classes. So a beginner's class, you know, just get your feet wet. Let's build a habitat and let's have a one page report max. What resources did I use and how did I build it? And let's just talk about that. That way that could be a great class one. For class two, we were thinking maybe a short-term science project. And you know, two examples here, three hotels being built, maybe each one's a different color, and then they go out and they see what kind of impacts by coloration that they have. Are they being, is one color used more than another color? Or they can come in to different hole sizes. Maybe one is a quarter inch diameter, one is an eighth of inch diameter, and one is a half inch diameter. And then they can talk about what they observed. Uh, pages max, and you can see some of the questions that they can utilize being listed there. Uh, so again, uh, I'm just going to go to the next slide. Same information, just set up differently. You can see, you know, reports included, yes, no, what class, functionality. And then a lot of it is really heavily towards the education. What did you learn? Tell us about what worked, what didn't work, and stuff like that. Uh, so really, that is kind of the impact that we wanted to have for some of these projects. I always have to have fun with my uh, audio graphics there. Uh, so this is where I kind of want to turn stuff over to you. If anyone has any questions or comments, I'm willing to entertain those at this time. TJ, I have a question about B Hotels. Is there any are there any materials that should not be used because they would be bad for the insects? 
So the materials that I would be, I would stay away from are, there's, so there's two things that I would consider. Think about like, I would stay away from something like metals. And the reason for that is they gain heat in the sunlight, right? And a lot of times that's gonna deter things away. Um, and you know, if this is one of your science projects for class two, I'd be okay with that really being in because you're testing it and showing results. But I, that's something I'd hesitate on for like class one, just because you're not gonna get a lot of response because of that heat. Number two is probably wood that's been treated. Uh, those are chemicals that could have a health impact uh, on any solitary bees that choose to use that. So really, those are kind of the two things I'd probably stay away from. Thank you. I see a question has come up that says, have I ever done a live insect scavenger hunt with aquatic insects to teach life cycles and environmental quality indicators? I've done that uh, in my graduate degrees at the University of Nebraska. I've not done that here in the Dakota, North Dakota yet. It's something I've always wanted to do. Uh, the reason I haven't yet is aquatic nets are super expensive. They can be upwards of $80, $90 per net. Uh, and that's really the reason I haven't done it yet, uh, but it's something that I've kept thinking about. So it's something in the next year or so, um, I probably will just finally bite the bullet and buy it because uh, it'd be an amazing thing to utilize, especially down at 4-H camp when you're alongside the Missouri River right there. TJ, I have a question about the scavenger hunt too, actually, if you, maybe you answered this, but do you have any suggestions for like how big of a group size you would do? I'm just thinking about like access to nets. Okay, so the nets, I have a benefit here in the Minot area that the, the NRCS office has 10 or 12 nets on themselves. So traditionally when I do it, and I have two nets on my own here too as well, so I get up to 12, but traditionally I do no bigger than groups of four because I want to make sure in time spans that they all get equal time with it. And if you start getting to, you know, nine or 10 people, I often question if there's enough time for everyone to get their turn. Um, there's a variety of nets, and I know I've started talking to Jan, uh, her and I might talk about trying to do a grant funding that maybe we could have an entomology trunk to get a collection of nets that could be checked out in future years. Um, so that's always an option, but I try not to really go above four just because I want to make sure everyone gets to use the net because it's such a fun activity that a lot of the students enjoy doing. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. I like the idea of a trunk or traveling nets if that was something you could do. Right. I guess I, for a quick question for me to you guys, you know, this is kind of a, a change to the state fair projects, the 4-H projects. Uh, is there anything any of you feel like we might be missing or a question that, you know, parents have come up to you guys to say, you know, we're looking for some help here. Well, maybe we can just ask who all out there has um, had youth to participate in um, this project at the state fair, like pinning um, insects or having a collection. Does anybody want to share about that or how that's gone? Okay, I guess nobody has done it yet. Um, Rebecca, I thought that you had some people at the fair. Not at the fair. I did the multi-county uh, project day and that's where I exposed probably 20 kids to pinning insects as well as uh, making those little bee hotels. 
with the cans and straws. Okay. And I know I've done a few local 4-H clubs here where they've started doing it. And, you know, going from, I'm going from memory here, a lot of the ones that I've done seem to be more from the larger counties. So I've, I've had some from Grand Forks County, Cass County, uh, Burley County, uh, Morton. And I want to say Williams are really the more common counties that I see that come from. Uh, and I know uh, I was talking to Sarah Clemens and Rachel Wald and Lynette Vockel. We were talking about doing like a pinning day here next summer here in Minot, uh, just to kind of expand even through some of the 4-H agents responsibilities just for them to be exposed to it and see it in action. Because it's one thing to see, a, you know, I can put my photographic on the computer and show you where the dot is, but it's a whole nother thing to experience it. So. Uh, that is something that will probably be coming this summer. So this is Katie Thompson. I'm in Walsh County. And last summer, I was judging a different project area. But one of their youth brought in a, an insect board like you've shared. But one of the moths was still alive. And it was fluttering. And I was like, OK. And Jeff Gale, you might remember this too, but I, I don't like bugs. I appreciate what they do. I do not like to deal with them myself. So um, I just wonder like, what's, a, what's the best way to euthanize or, or um, kill the bugs so that it's no longer moving, it, but youth can observe it because that's totally out of my realm of interest and expertise, but I respect it. Okay. Uh so this is a three answer prod three part answer so the first part is for me a kill jar um that has ethyl acetate inside and i actually have some of that here in my knot um and i don't know if emily goff is on the call or not but i know we uh at least there used to be some of that at that office too when mike Sauton was there as a 4-h agent um i lot of so it's like a um glass jar has a little bit of plaster paris on the bottom you just you know a few eye drops worth of that chemical and it absorbs into the plaster of paris and that essentially knocks them out very rapidly uh, the next option is you know i was showing off the uh you know the ziploc bags the prescription vials i will put stuff in there and i put them into the freezer the thing about the freezer is it's not an hour stay it's not a day stay Sometimes you need to look to about 10 days in the freezer. A lot of insects like grasshoppers, of course, we know they overwinter here and they have a really strong return rate the next spring as it warms up. So the cold just needs to be extended, okay, uh, in the direct freezer. Then there's butterflies and moths. And this is the hard one. You know, a lot of times I will still have students put it in the freezer, but when you put it in the freezer, the muscles start to tighten it so it's not as easy to spread out. So you can't spread the wings as easy. Uh, so that becomes difficult. So a lot of times in person, there's a, a blood vein on the abdomen of the insect that you can pinch that essentially cuts the flow of um, essentially the insect blood, if you will, not called blood for them. Um, but essentially cuts the flow and that will uh, essentially knock them out and put them asleep. Uh, a lot of times you'll know if it worked or not when you release it, give it about two minutes. And if it's not moving, then you know it worked. And if it starts coming back to life, you can pinch that again. Thank you. So Emily says there's entomology kits in the Ward County office. Cool. And, and you know, you heard me talk about ethyl acetate and some of the other stuff. Uh, I I always get asked, where can I get that? And you know, I have I always order online. There's like Flint Scientific and Carolina Biological and stuff. And a lot of those chemicals, I just get like a pint size thing, and I can make that last, you know, five six years. Um, and sometimes I can go longer depending how many people come in and out of the office. Uh, if I'm honest, I probably use most of it myself for collecting. Um, but those are two areas that, you know, nets are there. You know, they allow you to have 
photos. So if you're trying to help someone, what gear do I need? You can always click and set collection gear. And you can always just say, you know, that they suggest getting a net. They suggest getting a collection box and stuff like that. Not that you have to buy it there, but it's a good resource that just lists some of the things that are helpful too. Okay, well, we're right at 12 o'clock, so I'll just make a last call. Is there any more questions for TJ? Okay, well, um, I really appreciate TJ um, coming on today. Um, he's a fantastic specialist, and I like his enthusiasm for 4-H and always willing to help us out and so share this knowledge that I am not knowledgeable about at all. Like, like you said, Katie, I'm with you. So I appreciate you, TJ, coming on today to share this, and I will send this out in the recording um, this week. And also, if you have ideas for other webinars, just email me. If there's a project you want to learn, learn more about or a specialist out there that you might want to hear more from, um, let me know, and we can set that up. And so I'll send out an email um, for the next few weeks about what, we'll, what, we'll, what we will do in March. So thank you all for joining today. Bye. Thanks. Have a great day.